Hi, I'm Lee Stranahan. Welcome to Toaster CG. In this tape, we're going to be covering all the basics, all the essential things you need to know to use the Toaster CG, as well as getting into some advanced features, including using brushes, even using 3D elements as brushes, and some rules for creating great looking pages, some special effects, and a lot more. Now, we've got a tremendous amount of material to cover in this tape, so let's get into it right away, and let's start by talking about the CG book. Now, your CG pages are organized into CG books, and each book has 100 pages. And this is important for you to understand, because otherwise, all the work we could go through showing how to create a page doesn't make any difference if you can't save the work that you've done. Now, the way you have to start is you have to start in the CG by defining a new project. Now, what a project is, among other things, and we talk about projects extensively in the Toaster Essentials tape in this series, but what a project is, is a project basically is a setup that sort of gives you some default settings. And if we're going to create a CG page or a CG book, we need to define a new project before we start. So let's start by doing that. We're going to create a new project, and then when we save the CG book, it'll be assigned to that project. The way we do that is we go to the setup screen, and this section right down here lets us load and save projects. Now we want to save a new project. So what we'll do is we'll click where it says project here, and it shows us we have two projects right now, System 4000 and Test Project at 09. And it's on a disk called VT1. That's good. You want to make sure one thing you don't do is save it to the RAM disk, because the RAM disk is a way of using the computer's memory as a storage space. So anything you save to the RAM disk would be gone as soon as you shut off the computer. Probably not the result you want. So my hard disk here is called VT1. And let's just save. And what we need to do is we need to find an empty number here. And I will use just 001 because it's convenient. And the cursor's up, so we'll just type in the name. And uh, I'll just call this something clever like Lee's Project and click on Save. Now, you might want to save these projects with whatever name of the actual video project you're working on. So, for instance, if you're doing a wedding, you might call it, you know, Hibshire Wedding or something like that. And this way, you'll always have that. You'll be able to identify where the CG pages are that you want. Okay, now what we've done is we've saved the project. Now let's exit out of the setup screen. Let's hit Switcher. And let's go to the CG now. Now, it's important to set this project up first. Because anytime we hit save book now, it's going to save what we've done to this 001 lease project. And our book here is empty. Now, if your book has things in it already, at this point you might want to go and erase the book. And so let's start by talking about just the basic geography, and then we'll show you immediately how to erase the book in case there's stuff in here. First off, this menu is movable, and I can move it just by clicking the left mouse button down and dragging on where it says Toaster CG. This lets me drag this menu up and down to get it out of the way. Now, these buttons here control various functions, including setting text color, shadow options, border options, and much more. But there's another row of buttons, and you get there by clicking on this button, the F with the number of pages. This basically brings you to another series of buttons, which lets you do things like add a font, add a brush, save your book. This is where we'd save our book once we'd created some pages we were happy with. Load text, load an ASCII text file, or erase things. And you see this is a picture of an eraser. This erases the current line. This erases the current page. And this one here would erase the whole book. You click on that, it says erase the whole book. And then just to make sure you're really serious, it asks you if you really want to erase the whole book. Now you notice when you hit save book, it saves the book. That really takes it to disk. And of course, we have two warnings that keep us from clearing the book and no warnings that keep us from accidentally saving over from the disk. And this means you have to be careful, basically. You have to make sure that you don't accidentally hit the save book button. Otherwise, it's going to erase whatever's on disk and replace it with your current book for your current project. Now, this is all the more reason to do what we suggested at the beginning, which is go into the setup screen set up a new project, and then you can go back into CG and you're fairly safe. You're fairly secure that what you're going to do won't erase work that you've done on desk. So again, just be careful of that. All right, with those warnings out of the way, let's start to talk about actually setting up a CG page here. 
And let's click on continue. This brings us back to the other menu. So again, this button brings us to one menu and then the continue button up here brings you back to the first one. Now, basics of CG are pretty simple. This right here is your cursor and you can change the cursor's position just by clicking the mouse around. You notice I'm clicking the left button and wherever I click, the cursor shows up. And wherever you click and start typing, text will appear. So, starting to type. And you notice the text is very, very small. Right now it's being typed in the font that you see here, which is Common Thin 10. Now that's the default font. In other words, that's the font that the computer will start typing in unless you tell it something different. Now we can change that font and you'll see these little triangle keys here. All over the toaster, the triangle keys mean when you click the left mouse button down, this turns into a pop-up menu. And this brings us through the different font and the box. There's a box element here we'll be talking about. And we'll just pick another font. And you'll notice nothing's changed. Our text is exactly the way it was before. But when we start typing now, you'll notice it's typing in this new font. And the way the CG works is you need to select things before you affect them. In other words, we didn't have the welcome to this, the little text that we typed there. We didn't have that selected. So when we changed the font, it didn't know to change that line. It wasn't chosen. So let's talk about selecting things. And let me just talk about also erasing things. You have two keys to let you erase things. The back arrow key here brings you back. Or you can move around the cursor by using these arrow keys. There's sort of an upside down cross of arrow keys here. And moving left and right, moves the cursor left and right, move it under the T, and you can delete things. Now if we want to select this line, we can just click the mouse down and drag right across. And you'll notice right now it's selected everything but the last part here. If we were to go change the font now, it will change everything that's selected. If we select this now, we can change that font. And you'll see that we can have different fonts on the same line. In fact, every character can be a different font. And you'll find that in the Toaster CG, you can change color, shadow, outline, and font attributes on a character-by-character -character basis. Again, causing your CG pages to look like ransom notes if you don't do it with some taste and decorum. But that's up to you. We're just showing you how this works. Now, what we need to do is we want to affect the whole line. Is the shortcut for doing that is to click twice on one letter. And that will select the entire line. Now if we change the font, it changes it for everything that's chosen everything it's selected. If you hold down the shift key, if you have more than one line of text, let me just type in another one. Now again, I will double click here, selects the whole line. By clicking in a blank area of the screen, it deselects. If I hold down the shift key and double click, it selects everything on the page. Now these are the basics of getting text typed in and getting selected. And let's talk about another key that's very, very helpful here. That's the help key. And you just hit the help key and it brings up a list of keyboard shortcuts. The F1 through F10 keys here, these are the keyboard shortcuts for these buttons. These other keys here, uh, the escape key for instance, program up plus, this shows you how to go through the pages. You'll see right down here that Double clicking selects line, shift double click selects the whole page, everything on the page, and also there's an alt click which goes through selecting next layer. We'll talk about that in a moment. Okay, now there's another feature we want to talk about and that's kerning. Kerning has to do with the space between letters and you can control that as well from the Toaster CG. To do that, what we do is we'll just click here and now our cursor is on this line. And I can see between the W and the E here, there's too much of a space. So I'm putting my cursor underneath the E, and by holding down the Alt key and using the left arrow, you'll notice what it's doing is it's moving just the everything but the W closer to the W. And we can do the same thing over here. Let me go between the T and the O. The cursor is under the O, hold down Alt, and then left or right moves us left or right. Again, it will kern 
or set the proper spacing between letters. Now, another thing you can do is you can move around lines of text, the entire line, by using the arrow keys. And you can also move between lines of text using the arrow keys. And sometimes this is quicker than using the mouse. So let's talk about that. These arrow keys also, if you don't hold down Alt or anything, just move the arrow keys around. You notice going up and down is moving the cursor between these lines. If I were to hold down Shift and then, let's say, move down, well, let me, let me do an up here. It'll be easier to see the difference. You notice it's bringing the two lines closer together. It's moving the line that the cursor is under up. If I hit left, it's moving it, the entire line to the left. Hit right, it moves the entire line to the right. And the way you can do this is you can use the mouse to position things sort of coarsely, get them into rough positions, then use the arrow keys to really shore up the positions and get everything just where you want it. I'm getting a little bored with the fonts that are here. There's only these three fonts. So let's add a font. And to do that, we'd go to the font menu, click on add font, which is labeled plus F, and we'll click on that. And this shows us all of the directories that we have to choose between the fonts. And let's talk about our friend. This is our friend. The listing of fonts, this is in the toaster manual. And it talks about the video toaster font guide, and it basically shows you what all the fonts look like. This is invaluable. Let me just give you one actual practical word of warning. Now, all joking aside here, this is, I'm, I mean this seriously, if you've worked with clients before, you'll know this, don't show this to your clients. If you do video work and you work with clients, don't let them see this. And the reason why is you're going to add uh, a half hour or an hour of them looking through the fonts. Now, on the other hand, if you can charge for that hour, by all means, give them a copy. But on the other hand, this is one of those things where there's so many fonts that come with a toaster that the average producer, if, they're, if they have to make a decision like this, days later they'll come up with a decision. But for you, it's a very, very handy reference. And this lets you see what the fonts look like. So let's just load up a couple fonts, and I know a couple that I like. I will go to the font bank directory, H, and uh, H3M. I'll load up Harvest Italic. And now we can choose a size for the font. And we can choose anything between 10 to 400 scan lines tall. Now, 10 scan lines is obviously very, very small. 400 scan lines is almost filling the entire page. I'll just pick uh, 60. And you'll notice I don't have to get rid of the number here. I can just type in 60, hit Enter, and it will create the font. Now, although this font is showing up here, remember that it won't start, it doesn't actually change this. This wasn't selected. If we start typing now, however, anything we type will be in this new font. If we select this line, we then choose the font, and it will change it into that current font. Now, another thing that will happen is, and let me just select this line, you might think that if we have this selected, we'll go, we'll load up another font. And we'll leave 40 as a size for it. You notice it shows right here the new name. And this is selected. It looks like, kind of looks like this should be this font. Well, that's not the way it works. What you need to go through and do is if you have a line already selected and you load a font, you need to reselect the font that you just created. And that will create the, uh, the typeface. You'll also notice that when we change the typeface here, the kerning doesn't work as well. The kerning between the W and the E no longer is effective. So again, just Alt, use the arrow keys, and we can kern between those characters. All right, now let's talk about moving the text around with the mouse. That's very, very straightforward. To do that, you just click on whatever you want to move. And let's say I want to move this line. Well, this letter's chosen. If I were to drag this with the mouse, the whole line comes with it. And that's because you can't move individual letters unless you type them in individually, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, another thing that will happen sometimes is you will not be sure how big the font should be. So you'll sort of guess, basically. Let's say that this font, the Harvest Italic font that I have, is too big. Well, I'll add another one, and I'll just choose Harvest Italic. And instead of 60, I'll make it 55. And then again, 
select the whole line, we have to repick 55. All right, and let's say that's more what I want. You can end up, if you try this a few times, sometimes you'll have to try three or four different sizes before you really get it right. That's why this button comes in handy. This button here lets you get rid of a font or brush. And what it does is it will get rid of whatever font you have chosen here. And again, just erases it from the current book. So what we want to do is we'd want to pick Harvest 60. Well, let's go back. We have to pick 55. Notice by changing it, we accidentally changed the line here. So let's click in a blank area of the screen so no lines are chosen. Pick Harvest 60 as our current font. Then hit minus, and we'll just get rid of that completely. Now, what this button here lets you do is this tells you about, if we just pick the line here, it tells you about the current font or brush. And it tells you who, what the name of the font is, who makes it. Also tells you what kind of font it is, whether it's a postscript font or a type of font called a copyographic font, the height, that sort of thing, how much room it takes. And again, this can be handy sometimes, particularly when you're working with brushes. Sometimes when you're working with brushes, you're not sure what they are, where they came from. Now you can see that clicking in this blank area of the screen is pretty important because that deselects things. All right, let's say we wanted to do something like put text on a bank. So I was going to type in a word, and every letter was raised a little bit above the last one. Well, the way we need to do that is we need to enter each letter as an individual element. So let's talk about how we do that, because this is a very, very handy tip. It lets you do a lot of very, very powerful things in the CG. What we're going to do is we'll start by just moving the menu bar down here. And let's just click. And we're going to start typing. And we will just type in uh, letter T. Now, if I were to type in the letter E after this, or any letter, this is part of the same line. In other words, if I click on the E twice, it selects everything in the line, which is the T and the E. Well, I don't want that. I do not want the T and the E to be part of the same element, because then I have no way of moving the E up and leaving the T down. No way to do that. So here's what we do. Start by typing the T. Then I'm going to type, I'm going to just click the left mouse button here before I type. And by clicking here and then typing, this is now a separate element. If I click on the T, the E's not selected. If I click on the E, the T's not selected. These are different lines. I can move them around completely independently. So let me just put this back in position. Now I'll click here. Type my next letter. Click here. And every time I click, basically, it's setting up a new element. Now the point here is that every time you click that left mouse button, what you're doing is you're really creating a new element. Every time you click that cursor down in a new part of the screen, you're creating a separate element which can be chosen independently of any of the other elements. And to prove this point, I will create something that might look like it's the same line. I will click the mouse here, type in a word, and now I'll click the mouse again, pretty much the same space, type in another word, and it looks like these are on the same line, but these are actually different elements. You notice when I double clicked on the there, it shows the entire thing. Just there, if I click on high, just picks the high. These are independent elements that can be moved up and down without regard. Again, they're separate, even though they look like they're on the same line because I clicked right on the same general space. But the point here is every time you click that mouse, every time you put that cursor on a blank part of the screen, what you've done basically is you've selected a new element. And this is very handy because it's nice to be able to move these elements around individually. So let's get rid of some of the stuff that we've gotten here. By the way, you'll also notice if I have the A selected and I do an erase line, I can choose the erase line function here. You notice it only gets rid of the A. It doesn't get rid of anything else that would seem to be on that line. Erase line means basically erase all the lines in one element. Okay, so let's just get rid of these other things. And to multiple select, there's a couple choices you have. If I want to get rid of these, I, I can hold down the shift key. And what the shift key is going to do is it's going to let me select multiple elements. I've got all of these chosen. And again, I don't have the entire line here chosen. But because it's an erase line, you know, so every time I click it, it's getting rid of, it's taking one of the elements away. So I just click that three times, I get rid of all three elements. It takes them away one at a time. 
All right, now in the case of this, I can line up my elements just where I want them. Sort of dragging it and bringing it where I want it. Again, I can use the arrow keys here. That's the down arrow. And I can really line up things very, very exactly. You'll notice also in some cases, this is easier than trying to click on the element itself. It's a little quicker. So let's say I'm happy with this. Now I want to move the entire word. What I have to do is, again, holding down Shift lets us select all of it. And now that these are all chosen, if I click and drag, you'll notice that all of those elements now act as one big element. Now these basics of moving the text around, the way you deal with text, are very, very important. So we want to make sure you understand these very, very clearly. Now, the next thing we want to talk about is we haven't actually rendered anything to the screen. All we've done so far is just move the text around. So let's render to the screen, talk about how we do that, and then we can start changing attributes such as color, shadow, and outline options. The way you render with the Toaster 4000 is you have two render buttons here. This one will render the current line. And if I click on this, it will just render whatever line our cursor is under, and it will render it to the preview monitor. Now, when I go to render the line here, you'll notice it renders the current line, but it also renders a little bit more. It actually renders one segment of the screen there. So this is good for making quick checks. The thing that you do most of the time, however, is you render the whole page. And for that, you use this button here, the TV with number of lines on it. And this will render out to the entire page. And you'll notice when this is done, this key will show up here. And what this button does, the clapboard, this tells the toaster to take whatever we've done to program. So right now it's rendered it to preview. Now it's ready to go up to program. When we click this, we end up with our page brought up to the program monitor. And you can see right now what we're working with is we're working with a key page. And that is shown right here in the interface. Now there are four types of pages the toaster CG can create. The key page, the color page, the scroll, and the crawl. First one we'll deal with is the key. And what this does is it keys up whatever page you have. In other words, it overlays it on top of your video source. And it, video, it puts it over whatever video source you have selected in the switcher currently. So right now I have input two selected. That's where I have this videotape. And this way I can see how it, how it looks. Now, if I didn't have this selected properly, what I'd have to do is I'd have to exit out of the switcher I'd have to hit the escape key. This will exit out to the switcher and just pick whatever video source I want. And then when I re-entered CG, it would then put it up onto that video source. So just make sure you pick the correct video source before you enter the CG. Now, let's take a look at what we have on the program monitor. And it's not exactly a thrilling page right now. All the text is white and not very interesting. So let's just clean up our page here a little bit. First off, I'm going to kern between the T and the O. So I'll move the cursor under the O and t kern that a little bit. Also, let's get rid of all of the this little text element here, and let's just rearrange things slightly. We'll move this line up to the top. We'll move this one down to the bottom. And let's uh, just quickly re-render this. Now, keyboard shortcut here is the F9 key. Automatically renders you to the preview monitor. And the F10 key will send this up to the program once it's done rendering. And these are keyboard shortcuts that you use a number of places in the toaster. That F10 key in particular means render to the program monitor. And you'll see that in toaster paint, light wave, a number of different places. OK, so here's our page so far. And again, not exactly thrilling. Now, part of the problem here is the color and shadow and outline options that we have. Very, very boring. And let's start by changing those. Now, we can change our basic options for color, shadow, and outline by clicking on the color button here. Now, what this brings up, it brings up an entirely new panel that lets you change your text, shadow, and border colors but more than that, it also lets you change their transparency. And let's start at the beginning here. This determines whether you're changing the color and transparency for your text face, your shadow, 
or your outline. These sliders here, labeled R, G, and B, stand for red, green, and blue. You notice as we change these, the numbers change along this side, and the visible color changes here. We also have different color presets. We can click on this button, and it will bring up presets, such as yellow, for instance. Now, A stands for alpha channel, and this controls your transparency. And you can have transparent faces, transparent shadows, or transparent outlines. And you notice as we click through the things here that the text face itself is fully opaque. With this slider in the far right position, it's fully opaque. With the slider down here, it's fully transparent or invisible. Our shadow's fairly transparent, and so is our outline. Let's just change our outline and make that so our outline color. Let's first off change the outline color back to black. And our outline is now fully opaque. And let's just re-render. Let's hit continue. Let's just also go back and change uh, our current text face color to yellow and hit continue and render this out. Now one thing that's important to note here is this is only going to change the options for the bottom line, for the on with the show line. Let's hit F10 to render this up to the program monitor. You can see there it is. The, the outline, for instance, stands out much more than it does in the top because up there the outline is sort of transparent, whereas on the bottom one it's fully opaque, so it's much easier to see the outline. And the outline defaults to semi-transparent, so generally I always change it to fully opaque. Now the reason it only affected the bottom line is because these color sliders, any of these gadgets here actually, only affect what you have selected. And right now, just the on with the show is selected. So let's click to deselect everything. We just click in a blank area. Let's click on the first letter of welcome. And let's just change the color here. And we'll make this red. We'll keep our shadow options right where they are. And we'll make our border turned up all the way. Continue. And we'll just re-render that. And you're, see, you're going to see here, this only affects the W. This doesn't affect anything else. Now, nine times out of 10, you're going to want all of your text to have the same outline and transparency options. In other words, most of the time, you will want, let's say, an opaque border on all of the text. For this reason, one of the things I will usually do is I will select all of the text on the page, everything, and then set my options for it. Because again, remember the way it works is you have to select things, then choose what you want to do with them. So what I'll tend to do is I will set the options that I want to be similar for everything on the page all at once. Then I'll go back and change the color, for instance, on just the elements that I want. But again, the thing to understand here is you select things, then you affect the change that you want. It's the same thing when we're working with these other options here. Let's talk about these buttons real quickly. This button here determines whether your shadow is a cast shadow, no shadow at all, or a drop shadow. And the difference between a drop and a cast is that a drop shadow is attached, whereas a cast shadow, you can see by the little, little bit here, you can see that it's unattached. In other words, the shadow is not attached to the letter. You'll notice that when you have no shadow selected, these two buttons vanish. That's because these two buttons control which direction the shadow's going. And you can see this little white dot here represents the sun. And you can see how the, the picture of the shadow changes there. And this determines the distance on the shadow. It determines how far the shadow's going to be. This determines border size, whether it's no border at all, thin, thick, thicker, or again, back to none. And this button right here determines whether the border covers just the letter or the letter and the shadow. So let me just go through and do what I said I was going to do before, which is I'll select everything on the page. Remember, to do that, you hold down Shift. Let's click in the blank area first to deselect. Then hold down Shift, double click. That selects the entire page. All the text is now chosen. And I'm not going to worry about my text color here. All I'm going to worry about is I'll make my shadows mostly opaque, semi-transparent, but mostly opaque. My border's fully opaque. And I'm going to leave the color to black for both the shadow and the border. Now, you can change the shadow and the border color. But again, this is one of those things where 
We just hope your taste and better judgment will show through. It's extremely rare that I would change either the shadow or the outline uh, color. Black works pretty well for both of those. Again, there are times, but they're rare. So we'll leave those. I'm happy with everything here now. And again, that changes it for the whole page. Now I'll change this to a, uh, change this to a drop shadow here. Let's put the shadow down and to the left. And again, this is another area of cased in decorum here. Uh, you can create a shadow that goes straight out to the left or for instance, straight up, but you would do that never, basically. There's hardly ever a time when that looks particularly good. And the ones you use commonly are putting the shadow down to the left or down and to the right. If you're an anarchist, once a year, you'll put the shadow up and to the left or up and to the right. But usually it's just down and to the left, down and to the right. And the, the most common one is down and to the right. It just works better visually. Uh, it's just, again, a standard that's used a lot. This determines the shadow distance. And this one you got a little bit of free reign with. I usually leave it fairly close. I will set a medium border, and I will put it just around the letter, not around the letter in the text. And let's see how this looks. Hit F9 to render it. And again, this will set these options for the entire page. Now, once this is done, I can then go in and change individual elements. So, so far so good. I, I like what I'm seeing there. The, the, you can see that the shadow is definitely a lot darker now. Now let's talk about some of the other options here. We've covered uh, most of these buttons. Let's just click in a blank area to deselect everything and click this whole line. Now this button here determines whether the text is centered, flush left, flush right, or just anywhere you want it. And you'll notice if we have it centered and then we start to move it, the button automatically switches to the mishmash button here, sort of anywhere you want it. But again, there is a way here of just automatically recentering it. So one thing you might do is, if you want your elements near each other, we'll put these sort of up in the upper third of the screen. And now you want them both centered, is then just use the center button after you position them. And this way you can get them exactly where you want. Now, this button here will center what you have on the page. So if we click this, it will center whatever's chosen on the page. This is different than the last button because in this button, again, you don't have to have something selected. It just centers all of the text. And that can be very, very useful for just getting things lined up properly. And the next button centers everything down at the very bottom of the page. Click on this, and it centers it all on the bottom. And this is especially useful when you're using the crawl page. Okay, now that we've seen the basic building blocks of putting together our CG page, let's go and put together another one. Let's add a graphic element. Let's add the box graphic element. Now we want to go to a fresh page here. We have two things we could do. One is we could clear this page out. We could click on the erase page button and erase the entire page. Or we could just move to a different page. And there's a couple ways we can do that. Let's click on continue. We can use this button here, the up and down arrow buttons, to move us forward, that's the up arrow, or backwards through the 100 CG pages. If you want to go quickly to any CG page, just click where it says page 0 here, or whatever page number it has, and type in page 15, for instance. Hit enter. You automatically are at page 15. You can also use the keyboard shortcuts here of the plus and minus keys on the numeric keypad to bring you to any page. So let's just go to page one. And we're off to a fresh start here. And let's just do a standard lower third graphic. Of course, a lower third is a graphic that goes in the lower third of the screen. And it's usually to identify people or places generally, usually as an identifier. And let's create a lower third graphic. These are usually keyed up over video, keyed up over the person, place, or event that you're trying to identify. So. We'll just type in our text, and I will conveniently use my name here. And if we were to take this element and bring it down, lower third of the screen, we've got a lower third, kinda. 
I mean, it's a lower third, it's on the lower third of the screen, it's just an extremely boring lower third. So what we can do is we can add graphic elements. And the way we do this is by using the box, which is a built-in adjustable graphic element that you can use for a number of different ways. And that's always available. You select it just the way you select any font. Let me start by clicking in a blank area here. That deselects and it's gonna be, this is where the box is gonna show up. Hold down the left mouse button, it goes through my fonts, choose box, and this is our box. Now, this part right down here is a handle that we can use to resize the element. And this is always a rectangle. We can change the shape of it, but it's always gonna be a rectangle. And we can get it thin. We can use this as a very, very thin line. We can make it thicker and use it as a box behind things. And there's a number of uses for it, but let's just set this up. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move it over a little bit. And you'll notice, by the way, I can also use the shift arrow keys to move this around left or right. That again can be very, very handy, shift up and down as well. But let me just get the shape set for this. And I will put this as a box that's gonna go behind my name. And now let's drag this down right behind there. Now you have the same element for this box, for this graphic element as you would for any piece of text. You've got your color, your shadow and your outline options, and you also have transparency options. Now this is where transparency really starts to come into play because you can make this box semi-transparent and that is very, very useful and something that you see on TV all the time. So let me just set this up. I'll want this box, first off, I'll set it up so it's fully opaque. So again, the box is chosen. Click on color. And the T here again is the face. I'll make the face of this box dark blue. Pick one of the presets. And fully opaque. I'll leave it fully opaque. And I'll give it a sort of transparent shadow. And I will give it a opaque border. Let's continue. And let's just render this up. Hit the F9 key here to see how this looks so far. And I hit F10 once I see the uh, clapboard come up. Now, so far, this isn't really that interesting. It's a box, and it's OK looking. But let's make it a little more interesting. And the way we're going to do that is let's make it transparent. Now, one thing I'll usually do if I'm going to be creating a transparent box is I'm going to turn off the shadow and the outline options, because I really don't want this transparent box to cast a shadow. That would be a little bit strange. So let's go and first turn off the shadow. And again, it turns it off for just what's chosen, in this case, the box. I will also turn off my outline options completely and then just go back to our color and I will change the alpha channel, the transparency options, down a uh, little less than half. Let's continue and render this. Now when you render this up to the preview monitor, it's really not going to look any different. The payoff comes when you render it to the program. So let's hit F10. And there is your nice transparent box. Now, this is the basic functioning of this box graphic element. But you'll see you can create some pretty spectacular effects by using it. And let's just create a couple more boxes and show you the kind of thing you can do. We'll leave this where it is. And what we're going to do is click in a blank area and add another box. And this box can have completely different elements than the last one. Let me just kind of move it over a little bit. All right. I want to change the shape of this box here. And I will make it a little more squared off. And let's lay this on top of our element here. And let's make this box fully opaque. And let's make this one light blue. And since this is fully opaque, let's give it shadow options now. And we'll also give it a border. We'll also give it a thin border here. And let's just add another element here. Let's add another piece of text. And I'm going to load up another font here. I will load up Harvest, but I'll make it uh, 70 scan lines tall. And just type in a number. And this were our station number, we could then just put this right in the middle of the box element. 
And now we'll just select the options for this. I will make the number, I'll make that red. And I'm pretty happy with the other elements here. Let's just render this out to see how it looks. And render it up to screen. And there you go. Now again, pretty simple example so far, but you do get the idea that you can combine these elements, put them one on top of another, and achieve some pretty great effects. Now, one thing that you've seen you can do here is that you can layer elements one on top of another and build more complex pages by just sort of adding elements on top of each other. Now, the question here is, how do you determine which layer is on top of which? And the way you do that is you'd go to the other menu, and I'm going to start using the keyboard equivalent to switch between these two menus. The keyboard shortcut is the right Amiga key. That's the A key to the immediate right of the space bar. Whenever you hit that, it switches between those two menus. So let's go over here, and these buttons right here control the layers. And let's just pick this box. And you'll notice if we click one way, it puts the box behind the other box here. If you click this way, it puts it in front. OK, let's add one more element now that will make this a lot more interesting. And the element we're going to add now is brushes. This is a third kind of graphic element that you can add. The first two are the text and the boxed. And by adding brushes, you can create really great looking CG pages. Now, I'm going to just load up a brush that we've created already. But we'll be showing you how you create brushes like this later on in the tape. So we click on plus, plus brush. This uh, right here is the symbol for brush. And I'm going to load up an element uh, called DVE logo. We'll click in a blank part of the screen. Now we will just choose that. And you can see it's got the brush symbol next to it. We'll choose it, and you'll notice right here, we'll put up our brush. This is the brush right here. Now these brushes are 24-bit. That means there's 16 million color images that you can create by using toaster paint or LightWave 3D. And these can be elements that you draw by hand, elements that you frame grabbed, elements that you've rendered as 3D objects, or any combination of those. And again, we'll be talking about how we get those later, but you'll see the difference here in the way we can make this page look. Let's just choose the three. We will delete that. And we'll also choose this box here, and we'll get rid of that as well. And let's just bring this brush element down and kind of line this up over top. OK, let's render this to the program monitor. And you can see by having that brush there, it just adds a very, very professional look to the entire, uh, to the entire CG page. Now, the only thing I would do to this page is I would pick a different font. One of the big problems with this right now is the font is not exactly news looking. It's a little homey for, for, the, for the way the rest of the graphic looks. So let me just alter a couple of the elements and turn this into a workable page. One thing I would do first off is, like I say, let's just change this font. And I will change it to the Harvest Italic. And this will actually sort of echo the font that's being used for the logo there. Move this whole thing over a little bit. All right, that looks pretty good. Now I'm going to take the box, and I'm going to do, this is a common thing you see in uh, lower thirds all the time, is I'm going to make a thin line out of it that will extend behind everything else that's happening here. So drag this down a little bit. So now we're going to have this transparent line behind everything. And let me just make this flush left and render this up. And you'll see when this goes up to the program monitor, suddenly we're talking about a pretty darn nice looking little CG element here. Now, this is the key page. Let's briefly talk about the other types of page. Then we'll start to get into a few projects that use the tools that we've learned already. Key page, again, superimposes whatever text or graphic elements you have over video. The next type of page you can use is the color page. And we can change the page type by clicking here. This will bring up key, color, scroll, or crawl page. 
And again, it goes key, color, scroll, or crawl. So let's click on color. And it always warns you that changing the page type may cause some information to be lost. And between a key and a color page, you don't really have to worry about that. You really don't lose too much information. So let's hit continue. And let's just hit F9 to render this up. All right, here's the way a color page works. A color page puts color information behind the elements that you have on the page. And you have three choices here. It's either a single color, a gradient color, one color at the top and one color at the bottom, or a page that you load up, any page that you create. And this, again, could be something from Lightwave, from Toaster Paint, or a frame grab, or some combination of those. So the first one it defaults to is a gradient color spread. And it goes from dark blue to light blue. And here's the way our page looks. And again, you'll notice it kept all the elements. It's just no longer, we no longer see video. It puts it up over this gradient. Now we can change the way this gradient looks, or even, in fact, if there is a gradient, we can change it to other backgrounds by clicking on the color button and by changing this right here. You notice the paintbrush painting the background. What this means is it means we're changing what the background looks like. This is the single color. This is a gradient color. And this is a toaster paint background. This will basically, it could be, again, it could be created anywhere, but it will actually load the image up into toaster paint. And you'll see what we're talking about there in just a little bit. Let's start by single color. That's the most straightforward. You can use any of these presets, or you can dial in your own color. I'll pick purple, and then use a sl slightly darker variant of purple. Again, this is single color. We hit continue. Render this up, and this will just put purple, one color, behind everything. And in this case, that would look like this. Let's go back and change to gradient. Now, with gradient, you have, with single color, you just have these sliders right here. With gradient, it's a little trickier. You have to choose whether you're picking here the color for the top of the page or the bottom of the page. Now, again, some knowledge about color and a little bit of good taste will go a long way here. Typically, when I'm doing a gradient, I will either do a variant of one color. For instance, bl dark blue to light blue or dark purple to light purple, something like that. Or I'll use two colors that go along with each other very well, such as purple and blue or red and purple, for instance. I would typically not go something like red to blue because red and blue don't really share any colors in common, so the gradient's not going to look that good. And of course, I would never use something like purple and green because that would just be plain hideous. So what we'll do here is we'll just pick a nice variant of colors, and I will use a, uh, I'll use black on the top, and the bottom I will pick black, and it will bring up the red value a little bit, and make it sort of a dark red, maybe a little darker. Okay, hit continue, and let's see how this looks. And again, F10 to render this up to program. Shows us that gradient. Again, dark colors, black to almost any color. A dark version of almost any color works pretty well. Now, the third option you have is using a toaster paint background. And let's go up and choose that. If you choose paint here, normally what it will do is it will take whatever image is currently loaded into toaster paint and make that your background. Now, what if you don't have an image loaded into toaster paint? But then what you can do is you can load up any image. And this picture here, what this means is it means load frame. And this will let you load up any frame store that you have. Just so happens that I have a background that I've created already. So we will load that. And again, the same as with the, with the gradient color. You don't see the background. It's got paint chosen. But you don't actually see the background until you render. So let's hit F9 and render this up. and F10 to render here. Now, if you take a look at the background, what you can see is this, tech, this background was set up so that text would go in certain places. And the problem is, is you're basically shooting blind here. You cannot see the background when you're putting the elements on top of it. So you sort of place the elements somewhere, render, see how it looks, and then hope for the best. 
Well, there's a better way to do it, and it's by using a sort of cryptic feature of the Toaster CG that lets you overlay whatever you have on your interface on top of your preview monitor. And here's the way it works. To explain this, I'll explain something. We just hit escape to exit back out to the switcher. And the switcher has two modes of operation. In the normal mode, you have three monitors. And you can see right here, we have our three monitor setup. We have the monitor for the computer, program, and preview. Now, if we hit the help key, it toggles us into what's called the two monitor mode. In two monitor mode, you wouldn't have this computer monitor. You'd only have these two video monitors. And now we have just program. But this other monitor is a combination of your overlay of an overlay of the interface on top of preview. So in other words, here's program, here's interface on top of preview. Now, how does this affect CG? What difference does this make? Let me hit help to get out of it here. And let's go back to the CG program. And instead of hitting help to do it in the CG program, if I hit the help key, this will just show you that alt help turns your preview interface on or off. So if I hit alt help, what that will do is it will put my interface up on the preview monitor. It's going to leave program normal. How does this help you? Well, let me hit Alt Help to get rid of it. And notice when I hit F9, you'll see how this renders the picture up to preview. So far, so good. Now we hit Alt Help. And there is our interface on top of the preview monitor. And this now shows us we can see through we can see where the elements are here. So now I can see, for instance, that this text, just pick the text here. This whole thing should be brought down. So should this. And of course, so should the box. Now when we re-render it, we'll be able to see, again, being able to see where things render up. You have to re-F9 it here. But as soon as it comes back up, hit F10, and things are now in a much better position. So again, using this mode, using Alt Help to bring up the interface on top of Preview can really help you line things up. One thing you might want to do to get everything lined up a little more to make it easier to see is adjust the brightness or contrast on your Preview monitor. And again, this will bring things out a little bit more. Okay, let's talk about the next type of page. I'm going to go to create a new page here, so I'll hit the plus key to go to page two. And let's turn this page into a scroll page. Now, scroll page creates scrolling text like you see on a title roll at the end of a show. And again, of course, that's what the scroll page does here as well. Let's just pick our text first off, the Italianate font. And let's just start typing a little bit of text here. Go down a couple lines. One thing you'll notice here is that you're a little more restricted. If I try to click, for instance, up here, I cannot do it. So I'm clicking the left mouse button here. You can do this all day. You're a little more restricted in this page as to where you can put test. So and I'm just hit, hitting return a few times there. OK, so we've got our text here. And now you'll notice that we have some different options. First off, we don't have those TVs anymore. What we have here is the speedometer. This controls the speed of how fast the scroll will run. And you'll notice that the clapboard is already up. And the reason the clapboard is up already is because we don't need to hit this and wait for it to render to the preview monitor. These render on the fly. They render instantly. So as soon as I hit this button here, or hit F10, it automatically puts our scroll page right up to the program monitor. We can, of course, change the speed just by moving through the speedometer. And you have these five different speeds here, one, two, three, four, five. Here's the fastest. And the slowest is, well, pretty slow. In fact, it's so slow, you'll want to know how to stop it in case you accidentally go to the speed. To stop it, you hit the right mouse button. So just click on the right mouse button, and it stops the scroll from happening. 
I'm going to set it to a sort of normal human speed. And let's talk about this button. You have a few choices here. You'll notice right now with these sort of circle and the one, that means it will go through the scroll one time. If we click on it again, it will go to a point and stop. And if I run this, you notice how it stops right at the end there. Hit the right mouse button to fade that off. The third option is that it will roll endlessly. And it will just keep rolling like that. And again, you'll find there are some uses for that. The real, only real uses that come up often that I've seen are when you want something to run, such as you're using this as video in the workplace or something like that, and you need people to see the same thing over and over and over again in case they're not in the room. Usually, though, you just run it through once or run it through and stop it. Now let's talk about the option of running it through and stopping it. Again, this is where the right mouse button really comes in handy, because otherwise we'd be looking at this until the power went off. So right mouse button stops it. Let's go through the option where it goes through and stops. And you see over here on the left-hand side, this slider lets us move through and lets us move to any point really quickly. This is especially handy with long scrolls. Let's say, for instance, I wanted the first two titles to scroll, then to have a little bit of a space, and then to have to hold on that last title. Well, the way I'd do that is I would add some space between this produced by line and the final line here. Just move down. I want to add enough spaces here where I cannot see the produced by anymore. And now all I need to do is move the cursor below this line and add a few spaces at the bottom. And wherever I leave this here is where it's going to stop. So let me just go up and delete one space. That's about centered. Let's run this. And if you watch the program monitor again, goes to the first two. Then it goes up and stops there. And again, it will stop wherever you set it to. Now, one of the biggest restrictions on a scroll page is that you cannot have different colors on the scroll page. So, for instance, if your text is yellow, all your text is going to be yellow. You cannot change that on a line by line, word by word, or character by character basis. If one piece of text is yellow, the entire text is yellow. Now, one thing you can do, though, is change fonts. We could change this to any font we want. And again, that'll work just the way you saw before, except with our new font. Again, right mouse button to stop that. OK, finally, let's talk about the crawl page. And we'll go to a new page number here. And what the crawl page does, we'll change it to crawl, is it puts the text moving from left to right along the screen. And again, this is used for hurricane warnings in Topeka and for stock reports, a number of things. I'll just type in the text here. And you notice it automatically puts it down at the bottom of the screen. And as we type, it, uh, it scrolls right along with us. And so on and so on. OK. OK. Now, you'll notice this is actually very similar to the scroll page. We have speeds. You have four speeds to choose from here. And this brings it through one time. This will put it through endlessly. There's no mode to go through and stop it. So we'll just pick a speed here and render it. And there's your crawl page. Now, if you wanted to move this, so for some reason you wanted to put the crawl somewhere else, you could use the middle button, which moves you to the middle of the screen. Again, that would have the same effect. That would move you in the middle of the screen now. Now, you could move this anywhere on the screen, but you cannot do it with the mouse. The only way to do it is by using a combination of shift and the arrow keys. There's no way to grab this and drag it. Also, for that reason, you have to have everything be one text style. You cannot have multiple text styles. Everything is just one font. And you can use this slider to drag anywhere you want. This will let you move quickly through the crawl. So you can go to any point in the crawl very quickly. OK, now those are your basic tools in the CG. 
And if you go back over those again, these are the things you want to be familiar with. Most of the tools are the same, entering text, changing text color, outline style, shadow style. Those are all pretty much consistent from page to page. Now, one of the things you'll want to know how to do, however, is how to create and save brushes. And this is a very, very powerful feature in the CG, but a lot of people aren't familiar with using the tools to create and save these brushes. So let's do that. And we'll start by creating a simple brush in Toaster Paint. So let's exit the CG, and let's enter Toaster Paint by clicking on the Paint button. And you notice there's an image in Paint when we enter there, even though it was closed. And if you remember, this is the image that we had in the background of our picture before. The reason this image is there is when CG loads a frame, in other words, when you load a frame store, it loads that frame store into Toaster Paint. Even if Toaster Paint's not running, it loads it into the buffer that Toaster Paint uses. Therefore, when we enter Paint, there's already a picture here. And this is pretty significant for a reason that we'll come to a little bit later when it talks about saving these. But for right now, let's not worry about it. Let's just clear out this. And to give you a real quick Toaster Paint lesson, the right mouse button brings down these different menus. And let's hold down Picture Clear. That will clear it out to whatever color we have currently shown. And we'll use this one. I'm fine with the color that we have chosen here. And now let's quickly draw out an element to show you how this would work. I'm clicking on the rectangle tool. This will make it a filled rectangle. And I will go of a range of colors. Now we're in normal mode currently. Holding on the right mouse button again, let's just choose between these different modes. Range mode picks a range of colors between whatever color is chosen here and whatever color is chosen here. So I'll pick dark blue on this side. And I will click in this box, and you see the highlight box around here. I'll pick light blue on the other side. And now I will just draw out. I'm also going to pick a square brush and draw out a box here. And you see it draws it with that color range going from the light to the dark blue. If we want to change the way that range runs, we use this button here, the transparency control button, to bring us to the transparency panel. And by clicking on any of these three buttons here, not the first one, but the sphere or these two cylinders, it changes the way the highlights run. And in this case, it'll change the way our range colors run. So I'm going to make this a bar that is horizontal here. And I will pull this to the top. And now it's going to run from the dark blue color at the top down to the light blue color at the bottom. And to redraw that, I'm just going to hit undo. That will get rid of what was last drawn and redo. So here's a box I'm pretty happy with. And if you aren't familiar with toaster paint, again, we're going to go through this pretty quickly. This isn't a toaster paint tape, and there's way too much to cover in toaster paint to combine both of those. We have an entire tape to cover everything you can do in toaster paint, and even then, we really can't cover everything that you can do with it. But this is just to give you an idea of how it's going to work and some of the basic tools you'll need to know. So far, we've just drawn the box. The important thing to know here is how to pick up the box. Let me just add one other element to make this a little more interesting. I'm going to go to lighten mode. And I will go back to our main tools panel. And I will make this an unfilled rectangle. So it's now unfilled. And I'm just drawing an unfilled rectangle around the inside with lighten. And that will just give us a, uh, if I hit the F10 key here, it renders out. Let's take a look at this in program. And just gives us sort of a little bevel look there. OK. I'm happy with this so far. Now I want to pick this up as an element that I can bring into toaster paint. To do that, we have to do the brush pickup mode here. And that's the scissors button. And when I click on the scissors, and then I'm going to drag the scissors over this element, it's going to pick up wherever I drew around as a brush. And you can see I got a little bit of the white area there. And there's a trick that's pretty useful here if you don't want to pick up. The problem is when I go to scissors, it's hard for me to see exactly what's being picked up here. So I, I invariably sort of pick up the wrong thing. So by the way, when the menu bar goes away, you can bring it back with the right mouse button. So what I'm going to do is go to the filled rectangle mode again. And I'm just going to draw 
over this box. And I can see I just got the box I want there. I'm going to hit undo. Now I'm going to click on the scissors button. And now if I hit redo, redo does an operation to whatever area you last drew in using your new settings. So if I click redo now, it's going to pick up the area that I just last drew in, which is this rectangle, but with our new settings, which is the scissors, and it picks that up, like I say, it picks that up perfectly. So this is one way I have of making my life a little bit easier. I will draw with a normal draw tool to establish the area. Once I'm happy with that, undo to erase what I've drawn, go to the scissors mode, then redo, and that will pick up the area that I just drew in as a brush. Now this is picked up as a brush, and I can go to brush. This is, again, a right mouse, pull, right, right mouse button pull down menu. So I will go to brush, save, and it saves it to the images directory, and I can name this whatever I want. I'll just call this small blue grade box. And click on save brush. And let's exit out of here now. Right mouse button pull down. And we'll go to switcher, which just brings us right back to the switcher screen. Go into CG. And let's just go to load a brush here. And you'll notice it shows up. There it is, the small blue grade box. We'll just pick it the way we would any brush and render it out here. And again, this is just to show that the operation worked. And by hitting the right mouse button, you can see there is our brush, and now it's an element. And this gives you a couple big advantages. And of course, one of them is an extremely clean key. Right now, you can see that the key just looks absolutely perfect. There's no edging or any of the keying problems that are associated with the toaster's normal key or when you use it from the switcher. It looks just perfect. Also, you could add a semi-transparent drop shadow to it. And again, that's not the kind of thing you could do with the toaster's normal keyer. Now, the disadvantages of using this are when you use the toaster's normal keyer, you can move things around in digital effects. And we talked about that in the toaster essentials tape. You can fly elements on and off. But again, there's some real good uses for this. And I will sometimes use this for just over-the-shoulder graphics, not even with any text necessarily, just as a good way to get over-the-shoulder graphics going. Now let's talk about another way to do brushes and another important option that you can use to make your life a little easier in toaster paint. So let's escape back out to go to the uh, switcher screen, re-enter paint. And instead of using the pull-down menu to clear the screen, I'm just going to hit Shift-K. So keyboard shortcut Shift-K is for clear. And what that does, it will clear the whole screen to black. Now, clearing the screen to black is important for our next option, which is we're going to use the pick up a brush with no background. And that's going to ignore the black background here. And this really only works, only works well with black as your background color. So let's just draw out another element. We have these two colors still chosen, so let's go to range mode and draw out another filled rectangular brush. So far, so good. And let's just add another couple of elements. I'm going to go to lighten mode and just do a lighten at the top of the element here. This will create a fake embossed look. So there's our lighten. And now I'm going to use darken mode, which darkens things. And just draw quickly a little darken at the bottom. And again, you can see this creates a nice little fake emboss. And I will just render this up to show you how just this looks. OK, so far, so good. Now I want to pick this brush up. Now, rather than try to get very, very exact here, I can be a little messier if, before I pick up the brush, I click on scissors. Now, before I pick it up, hold down the right mouse button, and under brush, highlight no background and release that. And you'll notice that when I reselect brush, you notice it has an asterisk next to it. That shows us that that's chosen. And now, again, holding down the left mouse, I'm just drawing around it. I'm not too worried about the edges here, because this will pick it up without using that background color, in this case, the black. Now, just go to Brush, Save. 
And again, we'll call this blue bar. And we will exit back to switcher, back into CG. And let's just start a fresh page for this one. Use this as a key page. Load up our brush, blue bar. There it is. Now we'll add a little bit of text. Probably a little too big for the element, so we'll just pick a smaller typeface. Drag it on top of it. And let's render this out. So you can see now we have our text on top of that brush element. And you can see that it was a lot easier to pick up the brush using the no background option. Now you can see that using no background was a real help here. It let us pick up that brush much easier. And it can be a lot easier if we're dealing with an irregularly shaped brush. Let's go back and create an irregular shape. And you'll see that trying to do something like this, trying to pick very, very exactly, trying to be very, very neat when you're picking up a brush, just couldn't possibly work. And that's why you need to use no background when you have something with an irregular shape. Now to create that irregular shape, I'm going to use LightWave, the Toaster's 3D modeling, rendering, and animation program. And we can create text elements or boxes or anything we want in LightWave and then import them into CG just by going through that one paint step of saving it as a brush. So let's do that. Let's go into LightWave now. I'll hit Escape here and go to 3D. And one thing that's very nice about the 3D program is it shares fonts with the CG. You can use the same typeface in both programs. So I'm going into the LightWave Modeler program. And under Objects, there's a Text button. This lets us generate text. And let me just load up a font. I'll use the uh, Nanton Italic font. Just type in 3D Text. All right, let me use the center macro here. Under macro, I hold this down. This centers it. So this will give us an appropriate pivot point. And now let's give it some depth by using another macro, the shape text macro. And I will make this round. Just click on round, hit OK. It goes through a process here where it rounds off the text automatically and gives it three-dimensional depth. Now again, like toaster paint, LightWave is a big subject on its own, but you can do what I just did here. If you can follow these steps, you can create 3D text objects pretty darn easily. So I'm happy with what we have here for an object. I'll now save this. And I'll save this again, call it 3D text. As soon as it's done saving it, I'm going to go back out to the layout program. And let's go to Objects, Load Object, and just load that 3D text. And I'm going to automatically apply a surface. If I go to the Surfaces menu, Load Surface, and just click on Gold, this is a predefined gold surface that comes with the toaster. And it's pretty good looking. Now again, from LightWave here, I want to be in the camera view. And let me just select object, and that will pick the 3D text automatically. And I want to rotate it under mouse function. And I'm just going to rotate it on heading. That will tilt this edge towards us. So we can sort of see the three-dimensional effect here. And to lock it in position, I need to do, let me just move it a little bit more here so we can see the three-dimensionality a little bit more. I need to create a keyframe. So I just click Create Key. OK. And I've created a little scene here in LightWave. Now, one thing that's helpful to use in LightWave is the limited region function. This will save me a little bit of time, and it will only render a limited section. It's only going to render a limited part of the picture. I can access this quickly by using the keyboard shortcut, which is the L key. So I click on L. And this box here shows us what's going to be rendered. And by continuing to hold down L, I can drag the mouse, and I can just create this box so it just covers the text. And I'm pretty happy with the way that looks. Let me hit F9 
and this will give me a quick preview render of what we've got here so I can see how this looks so far. Okay, there's our text so far. Okay, and this is the way it's going to look. I am fine with that. I think that looks okay. Let me show you how we would save this and then load it into Toaster Paint now. What we're going to do is we're going to save this as an RGB image. And when you save limited region as an RGB image, it only saves that limited section. So we'll hit Escape to exit the screen. Go to the Record menu and click on Save RGB Images. And now we'll just call this 3D Text. first and hit OK and now I'm going to go to the render button and click OK here but there's one other thing I want to turn on I can see anti-aliasing is off here so let me just cancel out of this go up to camera and turn on anti-aliasing I'm turning anti-aliasing from off to low and then turning on soft filter and what this will do is it will clean up the edges it's going to make the edges look a lot better so I want this, I want the brush to look as clean as I can get it. So I'll leave anti-aliasing to low, soft filter on, continue, render. Okay, anti-aliasing is low, RGB save is on. Everything looks good. And we hit OK. And again, I'm just doing pretty simple, straightforward example here. But if you are familiar with Lightwave, and this is a pretty good reason to get familiar with Lightwave, you can create very, very complex brushes. So let's see how this would look. And here it's finished rendering. You'll see the gradient at the bottom. That's because it's only rendering the middle part of the screen. So it's only changing the middle part. The gradient really isn't there in what was saved. That's just left over from the CG page we created before. Also, if you look at our interface screen, you'll see it took one minute and 25 seconds. The magic of editing right there. We just cut that out so you wouldn't be bored, basically. I'll point out also the brush I loaded up before, the WDVE brush. That was created in Lightwave. Those are just text elements that I created in Lightwave. I cannot draw to save my life. I am not an artist at all. And so I use Lightwave a lot. I can't draw, but I can put objects together. And so I use Lightwave to create a lot of those elements. And like I say, if you're familiar with Lightwave, it's a very, very good tool to create a lot of these, these elements quickly and easily. So part one of the process is done. We have saved this RGB image. Let's exit to Switcher go into paint and I'm just gonna let it finish here As soon as this comes up I'm gonna hit shift K to clear the screen out and let's load a brush and I'm going to load that brush that we just saved 3d text first and you see it says 001 that's because it was frame 001 so I just remember the name open brush and here it is. This is the 3D text object we just saved. Now this is where no background comes in quite handy. So we'll click on scissors. Actually, let's click on the uh, filled rectangle first. Click on scissors. No background. That's generally the procedure I use. Click on the, get the shape you want, filled rectangle. Click on the scissors, then go to no background. Then when we pick it up, you can see it's picked it up without the background there. And we'll just save this as a brush. So I can, in fact, right, you see it has the name there. If I click on Save now, it will erase the old brush and replace it with this new one. And that's just fine as far as I'm concerned. I don't really need the old brush anymore. Let's exit out of here. If I do a quit, by the way, it will shut down paint completely. I have to confirm that. But that will save a little bit of memory. And I will even do a Shift click to shut down 3D here, to shut down Lightwave. Again, that just saves us memory. So now we go back into CG. And let's go to an empty page. And again, load that brush. And just select it. And again, you'll see when we render this up, it will key just perfectly. And of course, it also puts the drop shadows over there, which can look very, very nice. 
Another thing that's very nice about LightWave, aside from the fact that if I wanted the 3D text to be tilted another way, I could just tilt it. So I say this is why it's perfect for people who can't draw. All you need to do is just reposition it. You could also, of course, resize it. If I need this smaller, I would just make a smaller version, save that as a brush, repick that up, and I'm all set. Now, the thing you want to be careful with in LightWave is not to use any colors that are too dark. If you use any colors that are too, too dark, when you go to pick it up as no background, you're going to pick up some of the brush itself. So you want to make sure that you stay away from dark colors. And one way you can do that is just leave the lighting levels generally where they are in LightWave. And when you're picking surface colors, don't pick anything that's too dark. I tend to stay with brighter colors, and it just works out better when you're picking up brushes with no background. So we've created a number of pages here. Let's go through and actually save the book. If we're happy with this, we want to click on Save Book. And once you've saved it once, now it will warn you that you're going to replace it. We'll say OK. And it's successfully saved. And now let's exit out to the switcher and go into setup. And you'll see that from here, we could load up the Toaster 4000 project. And this will take a little while because it's loading all of the effects. And it's also loading a number of other things such as effect speeds, which colors you're using, that sort of thing. But once the Toaster 4000 project is loaded, I can actually load up the book of the project that we just saved. So in other words, I can leave the project right where it is, but just load up the book. And the way we do that is we would just select the project that we want to load the book from, click on Load Book. And again, now it's not loading up any of the effects. It's just setting up the book. And it's going to go through this process of preparing the book. What it's doing here is it's not only loading up the fonts, but it's also loading up the brushes. And since some of those brushes can be very big, that's what tends to take a little bit of time here. Let's go back to Switcher. And now here's the pages that we had before. You can bring up the Schools Will Be Closed page, any of those. And again, we just bring them up the same way you bring up any of these elements. We want to bring up schools will be closed. You click on load. When it comes up, you hit the space bar, and it automatically runs the element. OK, now that we covered some of the basics of CG, let's talk about some of the, some of the more advanced techniques that can really make your CG pages look much better. And one of the ones that I use most often is I use paint backgrounds all the time behind CG pages. And the reason why is that a paint background always looks a better and a lot more interesting than just a single color or gradient color background. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the procedure of creating a quick paint background and then putting our text up over that. And I'm going to talk about some of the problems you can get into with that. So let's quickly just go into paint here. And we're going to create a quick color gradient. We're going to pick two colors, one on this side and one over here. So I'll click in this box. You notice it becomes highlighted. Pick a dark blue color, then pick on this side, and I'll pick a lighter blue color. And I'm going to click here, go to the transparency controls, and this will give us the horizontal slider bar, which I will drag all the way to the top, and hit the W key to draw our color gradient. W stands for whole screen, and this will draw our gradient, the dark blue to light blue, to the entire screen. Now, we're going rather quickly through here in paint. This isn't meant to be a substitute for an actual paint tutorial, but if you do follow the steps here, although they're going pretty quickly, you'll find that you can recreate this on your own. Now, what we're going to do here is we've created this gradient background page, and I'm going to hit the F10 key here just to see how this looks. And it's being rendered the program monitor. And let's just create a bar to go along the top here. I'll select normal mode, choose purple as my color, and then I'll pick this, the vertical bar, and I'll drag it all the way over to the left here. And I'm going to put the slider on the right here. This is the edge slider all the way to the bottom. Now I'll just go back, pick the filled rectangle tool, filled rectangle, the squared off brush, and just draw this little streak, this little graphic streak up at the top here. And just to add a little spice to it, I will do a lighten. Let me just pick yellow so I can see my cursor better. I will pick lighten right up at the top. 
and darken. And again, I'm picking that mode with the right mouse button. And let's render this out. So now I have a little bar on top with the light and dark, and so it looks pretty nice. And this is a workable background right here, so let's just go with what we have. I, I can't help myself, I'm just gonna add one other thing. Since we're here, I'm just gonna add a darken below this bar, and this will add a drop shadow. And as we render that out, you'll see the drop shadow just adds a little bit more depth to it. So here we have a pretty nice looking background. And we have a couple of options. I could go straight into CG right now, and if I selected paint as the background, it would use this. But just to be on the safe side, I'm going to save this background. So again, holding down the right mouse button, let's just go and save frame. And I don't want to give this the same frame number as any other frames here. So I'll call this frame, I can see there's nothing between uh, 018 and 110. So I'll type in 109. That enters the number right here. Just type that in a numeric keypad. Now I'll click and I will just type in the name and I'll just call this background and click save frame. Now this frame is going to be saved. I can now exit paint. I'm safe to exit paint. So I'm going to again hold down the right mouse button and I'm going to do a quit here. This will actually close paint down. But since the frame's already saved, I don't need paint up. Okay, now let's enter the CG. Now again, if I want to use this as a background, I will click on key, and this will bring up my different pages. I'll use a color page. Let's click right here. And we need to choose our background, which we want to be paint. And we will load up frame 109 background. And remember, if we want to see this background, the trick that we have is, as soon as it comes up, we will hit Alt Help. This will overlay our interface on top of Preview. Hit F9. And now looking at the Preview Monitor, we can see where the bar is so we know what to type. So let's just quickly add a font here. Let's click the cursor and start typing. I'll just drag it up a little bit more. Okay, I can see this is going to line up pretty well. And let's just render that out using F9. Okay, so far so good. We've created a page. We could add more text to it. But here's the important thing. This background, the paint background that's there, is only temporary. If we were to go and create another page and load another background, it would replace this background so therefore you would have coming up over whatever picture you loaded up again. This is a real problem. If you're creating a page using a paint background, you have to use another feature. And what it's called is creating a buffered page. This button right here creates a buffered page. And you'll notice when I click on it, the screen flashes a little bit like where it does when we're rendering a page to the screen. But you'll see when this page is through rendering, next to where it shows the page number, there's gonna be a little lightning bolt visible right here. And what this means is this page is now rendered to the hard drive. It's now safe on the hard drive and it also means that when we call it up from switcher and let's hit escape to exit here. You notice the lightning bolt next to it? You'll notice when we go to load this page, I'll just click on load, it comes up very quickly. It's up. This is much faster than it would load normally because normally the computer has to recreate the page. Now, this also marries the text to the background. And this is the only way to be sure that your text will stay with the background. And this is such an important point, I'm going to say it for the, about the 15th time here, but this is crucial for you to understand. If you want the text to stay with the paint background, you have to use this buffered paint option. There's no other way than using buffered page. So we're back in CG now, and this buffered page seems to be a pretty good idea. Well, I've just sold you on the idea let me unsell you on it, because let me show you how easy it is to erase a buffered page. I've created a buffered page right now, and now I'm going to erase it by, let's go to the keyboard here, I'm just going to use my little pinky here, and I'm going to hit the space bar, and what I want you to see is watch on the screen right here where the lightning bolt is, watch when I hit the space bar, it's gone. Magic. What's happened? The page has been erased. Why has the page been erased? Because I made a change. 
by changing this page, the computer has to erase it from the hard disk because otherwise it would call up the same page every time and you don't want that. When you make a change, you want the computer to reflect your changes. So using a buffered page like this, you have to do it on one sense, otherwise the text won't stay with the background, but on the other hand, it is extremely dangerous because it's very easy for any bonehead with a pinky to come in and erase your pages with paint backgrounds. What do you do? All is not lost. What I do is I always save CG pages that have a combination of text and paint elements. I always save them as frame stores. And there's a quick, easy way you can do that. Now, one thing about frame stores is they're much tougher to delete. You actually have to go to the setup menu, hit the delete button, and something will warn you that it's going to delete the page. It's a lot safer. So the first step in saving this as a frame store, well, there's two ways we could do it. One is just render it to the buffer. And let's just do that. We'll render it up to the program monitor. Now, let's escape out of here. It's in DV1. You can see it's on my program monitor. We'll go to setup. Now, we'll go to a blank space. Say 201, that's the last frame here. Save, and we'll call it 202. Coming up. Now the question here is do we want to use one field or four fields? Remember, one field removes motion, four fields won't remove motion. There's no motion, so we'll get it on four fields. S saving four fields gives you better image quality. We just click Save. And sure enough, I see it loads up properly. Just might want to do that to check, but as long as you've got the right buffer selected, and one way to avoid any problems is just to select the same buffer. If it's in DV1, select DV1 in both Program and Preview, go into Setup, do a Save, and you are safe. Let's talk about using the load text function now. Often when you're creating a scroll, for instance, a title roll at the end of a show, you will be writing in something that somebody's already typed. And one of the other problems when you're creating a scroll page is often on a title scroll like that, people will need you to change names or move somebody up the list or move somebody else down. And that's kind of a pain to do when you're in the CG. So the best thing to do is to go into a word processor type in that text, and then simply load it in. The other big advantage is often what happens is you need to type in text in the CG, someone hands you a printed list that they've already typed into a word processor on another computer. So let's talk about loading things in. We're going to be using the text editor that comes with your Amiga computer called Ed. And let's just hit F10 to exit this setup screen. Okay, let's exit this main screen by hitting Control twice, then the Alt key here twice. And that brings you out to the Amiga's workbench screen. Now, if you don't come out to this screen, what might have happened is your system might have been set up to automatically boot to the toaster. If that sort of thing happens, you might want to consult your dealer and talk to them about it. Now, the Amiga comes with a built-in text editor called Ed. It's a fairly crude text editor, but it will work for our purposes. And to get into it, we're going to open up the shell window. And you will find a shell icon somewhere on your computer. And again, if you're not sure where this is, this is one of those things you might want to consult your dealer on. Now, I'm going to type in CD, which means change directory, a space. I'm going to type in toaster. And this will bring me to my toaster directory. Now, CD again. And I will type in CG text files. You notice there's no space between them. And this will put me into a drawer called CG text files. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to decide what I want to call this. So, I'm going to type in ed. And Ed will call up the editor, another space. Now whatever the name of the file I want to be is. So I will type in today's show. And notice I'm not putting any spaces in. I'm just making it all one word. And I'll hit return. And here we are in the editor program. Now in the editor program, this is a, if you're especially if you're a fast typist, this is a much quicker way to type in things. So we could just start to type in. directed by, and then type in our names, and so on and so on. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just skip ahead here and show you a whole bunch of names typed in, rather than you having to watch me type with my unique typing style. Okay, now here's our text file, and you see it runs down a little bit, and it's a little easier typing it in here than, again, it would be typing in the CG. Now what we're going to do is 
You don't have a lot of editing functions in Ed here. This is an extremely crude text editor, but hey, it's free and it's with the computer. If you want to, you might want to get a better word processor so you can do complete cut pasting and all the other sorts of things. Again, you might want to talk to your dealer about that. One thing we can do is a query and replace, where it will replace something with something else. And you know, as soon as I select that at the bottom, it says replace this. I'll type in Jeff with this. And I just type in the screen that I want, the name I want to replace it with. And it comes to the first one. Ask me if I want to exchange it. I'll say yes. And if I could do it again, for instance, enter the same thing, it would keep searching. So that's one thing you can do in that. Now we've created this. Let's save it and then go back to the CG so we can actually load this up. So what we're going to do here, just do a save. And this will save it with the name Today's Show. Now we'll exit Ed. Click on this button up here. That shuts us down. And now let's hit Control, Control, Alt, Alt to go back to the Amiga and enter the CG. And we're in CG. Let's go to an empty page, move to the next page here. And we will set this page up as a scroll page. What we're going to do here is we'll just go to the secondary menu, do a load text, and it shows us the name of the CG text files. And when we went through that process where we went CD toaster and CD CG text files, that just made sure that the file we were creating in Ed created it in the right place. It's in a directory called toaster on your hard drive. And inside of that directory, there's another directory called CG text files. And that's where we create the pages here. So we'll just click on the name of the page, in this case, today's show. And it's going through and loading up the entire page with whatever font we have and with whatever options we have chosen here. So as we go down here, you'll notice, by the way, it's also centered at this point. That's because that's where our cursor was. If we go back, you can see it was in the no justification mode. So let's change things a little bit here. Let's just change this so it's all left justified. Let's go back to the other page. Clear out this page, erase it. And now we can just reload the text up. And again, it will use whatever options you currently have selected. So now it's all along the right-hand side. If we wanted to center it, we just could clear the page out. Load text. Let's, let's set center first. So we'll go to the center option. Now go back, load text. And now the text will all come in center. So again, it works with whatever options you currently have chosen. And if we need to make changes, it's much quicker to go back into our word processor, cut, paste, and move things around if you have those capabilities, just erase the page and reload it, than it would be to move one name somewhere else. And this will work just fine. Let's just render this up just so you can see how this would look. I'll just hit the F10 key here. That's all the time we have for this tape. Now, the basic skills of CG are pretty straightforward. The things you might want to work on and especially get pretty good at that will really bring your CG pages to life involve the brushes. The capability of the Toaster CG to use brushes is very, very important, but it involves knowing a little bit about toaster paint and also, ideally, a little bit about Lightwave, too. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to write to us on the address you see on your screen now. Until next time, I'm Lee Stranahan. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.